you all can see that. Okay, so let me just take a problem out of the book real quick um, so you can see maybe what the difference is between the two. So here's two reactions to make um, an ether. Let's say that's tert butyl methyl ether. So you're starting with um, two different electrophiles and then two different nucleophiles. And the question is basically saying of these two different methods, which one is going to be the most successful in making that desired compound? So maybe we'll call it method A, method B. What type of electrophile do you see in method A? How do you classify it? And then method B is a methyl electrophile. And so then when you're looking at the nature of the nucleophile, you have sodium methoxide versus sodium tert butoxide. So if you were to do a substitution reaction, method B would be the most appropriate to make that compound through an SN2 reaction because you have a methyl electrophile and then your, your nucleophile is a good nucleophile, sodium methoxide. The reason that A is not a good reaction, you have a tertiary leaving group with a strong nucleophile. So this will do a reaction, but it's not going to do substitution. It's going to do elimination. So if you still wanted to make uh, tert butyl methyl ether, but using an SN1 reaction, you, instead of using sodium methoxide, you would use just methanol and heat. So you see the difference there, right? So SN1, you need a tertiary substrate. You need a, a, a polar protic solvent and heat. That helps the ionization occur. So that's the rate determining step in SN1. Then the solvent, which is also the nucleophiles, incorporated into the product. So let me pick um, let me pick another SN1. book here. So we're starting with a what what classification of alcohol? How many? So we have a tertiary alcohol, 
we're treating that with HBr, which is strong acid, and then we're ending up with what type of bromide? So a tertiary bromide. So if you look, there is substitution of OH for Br, and then underneath it says racemic. So looking at the starting tertiary alcohol, what stereochemistry does it have? What can you assign to that center? Say what? I'm going to say it's S. Does everyone follow that? So in this case, the methyl group is the lowest priority, and it's facing you, so whatever you determine, you flip. So we're starting with S, and it's telling you that through the mechanism, that center racemizes. So SN1 chemistry proceeds with racemization. SN2 chemistry proceeds with inversion. So those are two terms you need to know, inversion and racemization. So SN1 proceeds through racemization. SN2 proceeds through inversion. So let's understand why that is. We know that based on the way that product is drawn, you have to get rid of that OH. You're treating the starting material with an acid, so the substrate is acting as a base. It gets protonated. The arrows start at a lone pair, so there's the action of the base abstracting a proton. So this is pretty fast. Proton transfers are pretty fast. And I'm going to write the bromide counter ion just so that we're balancing charge. So anytime you propose a mechanism, your pluses should equal your minuses for a net overall charge of zero. So now this is the slow step, is the ionization. This is, it's slow because you're, you're forming a carbocation. And the hybridization now is changing from sp3 to sp2. So that's, an, that's a very uphill process. And the thing you form is an intermediate. So we lose water. So I'm, I'm going to draw this a certain way um, so that you can see what they mean by racemization. So when a hybridization changes, the carbon becomes sp2 hybridized. That means it's flat, and then you have the p orbitals. So what, it, what is that going to look like? pretty shitty but there it is so the, the carbon center is flat the p orbitals are above and below the stereochemical information of s no longer exists so what it what do we mean by racemization The bromine can attack the top lobe or it can attack the bottom lobe, and it's going to do that evenly. So let's draw both because you're going to get both in a one-to-one -one mixture. That's what a, a racemate means. So what is the relationship between those two compounds? So they're, they're mirror image enantiomers. 
And just for practice, let's assign R and S to the top one. So the top one's S, and so the bottom one is R. So a one-to-one -one mixture of enantiomers is a racemate. So if you took the optical rotation of that racemate, what should it be? Be zero. So how would you prove using some sort of spectroscopic method that bromines in that final product. How would you know? What? So the mass spec, which is gonna show you what? Say it again. Yeah, the bromine's gonna have the one-to-one -one ratio. So again, you'll probably see that in the parent region um, due to the contribution of those isotopes. What the hell? If you are given this ester, and you are treating it with lithium iodide. And the solvent was DMF. What do you think the products would be? So DMF is what type of solvent? Polar aprotic. You have lithium iodide. So lithium is a cation. It's not really going to participate other than balance out charge. The lithium is going to be a nucleophile. What is that lithium going to attack in the starting material? Iodine. Or sodium, the, or sorry, the, the iodide. So let me, let me put it this way. The, the leading question was DMF's polar aprotic, so that should get you thinking about SN2. In SN2, the electrophilic carbon has to be what hybridization? SP3. So you have a couple different SP3 hybridized carbons in this molecule. Let me label them. A, B, and C. So which carbon is the iodide going to attack? 
C. You understand why that is? We put in the lone pairs there on that oxygen, that's delta minus, that's delta plus. And so from there, what you're doing is matching the polarity. So this isn't a leaving group that you've seen, but you should be able to make the connection. So if we have this lone pair from iodide attack that carbon, that's then going to leave. And why is that a good leaving group? Because the, the carboxylate that's formed is stabilized through resonance. So that's, that's called a lithium carboxylate. The conjugate acid of that is a carboxylic acid, which has a pKa of what? About five. So that's sufficiently low enough to make that a good leaving group. Yeah, the final product is the methyl iodide and the lithium carboxylate. It did. Yeah, the whole, th you, you definitely don't want to start leaving things off. Remember that problem we did and it was people just, cho they chose like this oxygen and they didn't put like the methyl group attached to that oxygen. Like all of that stuff leaves. So let me, let me put a substrate, some conditions up, and then you can tell me what the product is. So it looks like we're starting with 2-bromopentane. What, what would be a, a better name for that? I left something out. What did I leave out? What's that? Which, which is it? It's S. So it's what type of leaving group? Classification. So secondary, so we're a bit iffy. 
DMSO is what type of solvent? Polar aprotic. Then your nucleophile is sodium cyanide. So that's a good nucleophile because it's a salt. There's a metal cation and then a nucleophilic anion. So the difference between a strong and a weak nucleophile, a weak nucleophile is one that is just neutral, it's just like a solvent, like methanol or formic acid or ethanol or something like that. So what mechanism does this occur by? So it's going to be SN2. So draw the product on your, your paper and then tell me what the name is. I'll write the name and then I'll write the structure. What's, what's the name? So we're using potassium cyanide. Cyanide as a substituent is named cyano, but it's not a substituent in this case because it, it has to be incorporated into the parent name. So whatever you come up with, the parent is going to be nitrile. Not quite. It's, it's close, you're just missing something. Correct, because it's not a substituent. It has to be placed in the parent. and something else. When you, when you substitute, you're substituting bromine for CN. So what's the longest chain length then? It's five. And then there's a methyl group. So two methyl, pentane nitrile, but then what's the stereochemistry at position two? What'd you say? I don't think so. Because now the lowest priority group is facing towards you. Because when you do the SN2, the inversion occurs so up there, the, the protons and back. When the inversion occurs, it's now coming out towards you. So there's that part. Because it inverted, I believe you're getting the R stereochemistry. Do 
you remember what, what's the hybridization of the carbon in the nitrile? What's that? So SP. What other functional groups can you think of that have SP hybridized carbon? What? So alkynes? <laughs> Do you remember where a triple bond stretch occurs in the IR? 2,000 to about 2,400. So depending on whether it's CC or CN, they're going to shift a little bit different, but they're 2,000 to 2,400. So again, that's much different than the 16 to 1,800 you see for, for double bonds. So the easiest thing you would do to prove that this reaction worked was to take an IR and look in the region because you're going to see a very strong CN triple bond stretch in that region. What's that? Uh, so yeah, you, you get the inorganic product, which is sodium bromide. So when you run these things in lab, typically what happens is the salt will precipitate out of the solvent. That's how you, you know the reaction's progressing. But that's all dependent upon the solubility as well. Not necessarily. Okay. So I've, your book presents substitution and elimination in one chapter. I don't test you on it that way because if you make a flow chart of all the different things you can do, it's overwhelming for a student to learn. So that's why substitution is separate from elimination. Okay. Because it, it, it comes to the point when you look at the nucleophile, you gotta ask the question, is the nucleophile acting as a nucleophile or a base? Then if it's a base, it goes elimination. And so that's where it can get confusing. So I'm, I'm not about, I mean, I don't wanna brag, but I could, I could like run circles around you and confuse the hell out of you, but what does that prove? I mean, you're, you're paying the bills, you need to learn this stuff, so. It's not my intention to, to tank what's going on here. So can you like give us an example of like an ACS level question about a substitution reaction? Or would you say yes. kind of how you're doing already? Or? I'll, I'll, I'll pick some right out of this book here. So in the version I have, it's page 48, problem NS11. They write it slightly different, but here are the conditions. You're taking ethyl phenyl ether hydrogen bromide acid and heat. And so I'll write down what the choices are for the answers.
so we have ethyl phenyl ether plus HBr and heat, and there are your choices. This is a substitution reaction. What do you know about substitution reactions in general? <laughs> One, thing is One thing is substituted for another. The, the carbon bearing the leaving group must be what hybridization? SP3. This carbon is what? This carbon is what? So when you make that distinction, the, the two carbons bonded to the oxygen of the ether, because we know that this is delta minus, that's going to be delta plus. The sp2 hybridized carbon, maybe you have a little delta plus on it, but the action has to happen at an sp3 hybridized carbon. So if the ether is acting as a base, it's going to get protonated. So that's an acid-base reaction. Now, if you look at what forms you have oxygen plus and Br minus, the minus is always the nucleophile. It's supplying the electrons. You know that in a substitution reaction, it cannot attack an sp2 hybridized carbon. So it has to attack an sp3 hybridized carbon. So it's going to attack that carbon. That group leaves. And that should make sense because you know oxygen wants two sigma bonds and two lone pairs. So that's going to get you choice B is the correct answer. Choice A is wrong because they're showing bromine attacking that carbon. That's not allowed. And C has it as well. So if you have this and you've been doing some of these problems, you'll notice that not all of the time, but for a good portion of these, you can use a certain logic. If you eliminate distractor choices, the two remaining ones are, are they're, they're not night and day different. You still have to use some logic to differentiate them, but if you can get rid of the distractors quick, then it leaves you a better chance of being correct. So let me, let me pick another one out of here. So this one will be This is going to be a substitution reaction, so an, an SN1 reaction, where you're starting with this. Again, you're treating with HBr. So substitution reactions, you're either you're incorporating solvent into them or you're using some acid that's incorporating the, the, the halogen X minus. So we, we're starting with what sort of alcohol? What's the classification? So here are your choices.
Let's look at choice A. How do you classify that bromide? It's primary. If this is going through SN1, a primary carbocation will definitely not rearrange, or a secondary carbocation will not rearrange to a primary. Because we need to follow the stability trend for carbocations. And what really what I'm doing is you see that we're starting at a secondary and where that bromine ends up. That's what we're classifying now. So for B, that's how do you classify that bromide? So tertiary, that's a possibility. C is tertiary as well. And then D is primary. If we know this is going through an SN1, a secondary is, is not going to go to a primary, so we can get rid of A and D. Now that sort of leaves us with a conundrum about B and C. If you let me draw some dots in to sort of map things out, you'll, you'll see like in, in B, there's a hydrogen here, right? But in choice B, now that that group has two methyls, so you could ask, where does that methyl come from? But then if you look in C, the ring is going from four, here it's four, here it's five. So in either case, some sort of shift is happening. So let's protonate that alcohol. So alcohols can leave once they're protonated. They have to be protonated. They form an oxonium and then water leaves to give you a carbocation. So I'm gonna put the four back in there. So if that ionizes, we get a secondary carbocation forming. I'm just going to draw that hydrogen in so we don't lose track of it. Now if you look at that, that will not go on to form A, B, C, or D. So we really, we really can't even go on to form B. So the correct answer is C. And I'll tell you why we can't form B after we examine why it goes to C. All the carbons in the, in the four-membered ring are what hybridization? They're sp3. So a cyclobutane is a square, and then the internal angle of a square is 90 degrees, right? So that's significantly constrained from 109. So that ring wants to open up, and by doing so, it relieves that strain. So today we saw a, a hydride shift. That's where hydrogen moves over. So this is a secondary carbocation. 
I'm going to say that this bond here in red is going to move over. I'm going to draw it sort of the way it looks. It's going to look weird, and then I'll redraw it. That whole bond is going to move over, and that's going to open that ring up. So here's the red bond. It's moved over. Now that plus charge moves over to here. And so that's what type of carbocation now? It's tertiary. So what does this really look like? Let me put some numbers in so you can follow. I'm going to call this, call the carbocation one, two, three, four, five. So there's five carbons. Let me just redraw them. I'll put those numbers back in. Carbon one has a methyl group plus a plus charge. Carbon two as a methyl group and that hydrogen, three, four, and five are all CH2. The bromine's still floating around. And at this point, it captures that tertiary carbocation to give you C is the correct answer. No. The driving force for these is the formation of the most stable carbocation, regardless of what you start with. Is there a reason why they're two carbon one instead of carbon two? Like, would the carbocation be able to move to carbon two at all? So why, maybe you're asking, why doesn't it just trap at this stage? No, it, once it forms, once it goes from two to three, again, it, it's weird to explain. I don't know it. I've never seen it. It's only from things I've read. From two to three, it's stable. And in, in from that, it's sort of, it is what it is. It's not looking around to get more stable. It's not a, it's not a player. <laughs> so it, it's satisfied once it gets there. So I showed you this maybe a couple weeks ago. Like when you eat food and um, you have these enzymes that form that lanosterol, that really long polyalkene, there's enzymes that come around and put it in a conformation and it cyclizes to form basically a steroid nucleus. So when that happens, you get all sorts of these rearrangements occurring but they're all thermodynamically driven by going like primary to secondary or secondary to tertiary or whatever. There has to be a justification for it. Usually a tertiary will not go to another tertiary. Let me put up uh, another one from the ACS study guide here.
So this is again in the nucleophilic substitution and elimination section, page 56, number 29. It says, which two compounds ionize with loss of bromide ion to form the same carbocation? What's that again? So you're given choices A, B, C, and D, and those choices have two numbers, and numbers correspond to those different bromides. And it's asking you which two bromides ionize with loss of the bromide ion to form the same carbocation. This question is so straightforward, you'll fall off your chair. What do you think the answer is? It's C. Why is it straightforward? Look at the carbon, look at the carbons bearing the bromines. So this one and that one, the carbon is sp2 hybridized. Those will not ionize. So what does it mean by one and four are ionizing to the same thing? So let's, let's just draw that out so you see. So you're probably thinking, well, that's a primary carbocation. Yes, but it has resonance. So this was compound one. And if you look at compound four, when that ionizes, it's going to give the resonance hybrid. So we have time to do one more. Um, I'm going to go to that physics lecture tonight. What's that? Yeah, if it's over in the Tad Cochran Center. So uh, let, let's do one more, and this relates to carbocations. So I know we didn't cover it a whole lot, but... I'm going to draw these slightly different than the book. So I, I drew them that way, your book draws them with CH, CH2, CH3. Um, so the question is, which carbocation would not be likely to undergo a rearrangement? So the correct answer is C. So how do you want to go about solving this? The first thing you do is just classify them. So A is what type of carbocation? Secondary. B is C is tertiary. D is primary. 
So the tertiaries will not. So why do we, how do we want to understand that? So there's the carbocation stability trend. And again, what you're looking at is in relation to the other one, C is tertiary. So that it's already stable. It, it, it doesn't want to rearrange. The secondaries and primaries are looking to rearrange to something more stable. And these substrates will. So this is notation we'll start using um, on Friday. If we call the, the carbon bearing the plus charge the alpha carbon, the carbons next door are the beta carbons. And so what you have to do is look at the beta carbons to see if a rearrangement can occur. So for A it can, and it'll basically be this hydrogen moving over to give you a tertiary carbocation. For B, you have beta, beta prime. Now it's not a hydrogen, it's an actual methyl group. So if that moves over, you now end up with that tertiary carbocation. So if we, if we look at C, we have beta. Those betas are the same, then you have beta prime. If you try to move any group from those, you're going to go from tertiary to primary. So if, if this hydride moved over, so that's not allowed. Or if you look at beta prime, you're going from tertiary to secondary. And again, that's not allowed. In D, this moves over. So that gives you tertiary, so that's allowed. If you're a visual person, how can you think about this? The carbocation is sitting in a well. If it's really unstable, like that primary one in D, all it has to do is go over a little hump down to a tertiary one, and it's still in that well. So it, it, it's about a, a, a pathway. And so these pathways are three-dimensional. It's like, do you know what a contour map is? If, if, you, if you're looking at a mountain range, like straight down, they're just like, the, the, the mountains are drawn as like circles. So that's a contour map. And so if you were looking at this energy surface straight down, it looks like a mountain range. So you're looking for the lowest energy well uh, for a rearrangement to occur. So I think with that, we'll wrap up for today. Uh, we'll have another review session tomorrow in the tech building. If you have any burning questions, shoot me an email. Um, but I'll post this on.